the infiltration case ends and then my true uh, identity, like who they thought to be Jay Bird Davis turns out to be Jay Dobbins. The gun runner debt collector turns out to be an ATF agent. So the, the angels issued contracts on me. They were farmed out to the Aryan Brotherhood. They were farmed out to the MS-13. 18th Street picked one up here in Los Angeles. <laughs> I want to start just by saying how how much of an honor this is for me, man. Like, uh, we're, we're full disclosure, we're meeting for real the first time today. Um, it's a it's it's a joy for me, and um, I'm so grateful that uh, you would do this. Uh, I read your book uh, years ago, years ago, and um, I was uh, utterly blown away and and, and fascinated. Um, in my opinion, um, you're nothing short of a hero. You exemplify courage, strength. Um, you're a wild man. Uh, I, I, I learned so much, strangely, about my whole acting process uh, by the way that uh, you approached your work. Um, I do it, uh, you know, my work is putting on makeup and saying lines for a living, and I, I operate under the umbrella of safety. Uh, you put yourself out there in... Um, uh, it's such an insane way in your life. Um, and I just, I, I have so much respect for you and I'm so glad that I get the chance to actually kind of meet you and look you in the eye. So, so thank you, man. Thank That's you. Thank you for kind. coming, bro. Thank so you for like, so when you compare like, uh, like acting to, you know, and, and like your process. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been, uh, I've like, I've been in a couple films, mm -hmm. right. A acting, playing, uh, a cop. Yep. Right. Is much harder to do as an actor than it is to do operationally on the street. Why is that? When you're when you're acting, you 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 have a script to follow. Sure. You have a director there who's who's orchestrating things. Sure. You're surrounded by a crew, and it it steals all your spontaneity. Yep. Like if I'm if I'm out on the street, I can take it and I can control the situation however I want. Yep by what I say, by what I do, um, by my actions. I don't, you don't have the freedom for right, that as right, an actor. Right. So like when I've had some acting spots, like small, right? Nothing uh, to uh, be uh, of significance. I thought it was super hard. Sure, sure. Like you have to deliver a line and you sure. have to like honor the writer's sure, words sure. and the director's instructions and all the people looking. I, th I thought it was way harder. But I, but I imagine with so many of the the so many of the undercover agents that you've worked with over the years, I'm sure you. I mean, there was something that set you apart, correct? Like your ability to improvise, your ability to go deeper, your ability. I mean, I'm, we're just talking about Mel Chancy, and I, I, I want to get into like a proper introduction, and all that. But we're just talking about Mel Chancy, and I, I one of the things that really struck me is is is. Uh, you know, when you were in New York, you were there, I think at like a convention or you were there with like a bunch of other ATF agents and you were like, I want to go over to the Hells Angels clubhouse. Like I want to just go over there because you're so sort of deeply, you know, in this guy and in this guy's soul and in this guy's shoes. And you know, the other agents were like, you out of your fucking mind, but you made your connections. You called your people in Arizona, they got you in and that's where you met yeah. Mel, who's a, a, a friend of both of ours, um, you know, sort of legendary Hells Angel. But you know, you wanting to do that, you, 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 you having both the urge to do that, knowing that it might help your case or it might just be that's where you wanted to be. Maybe you felt more comfortable with those guys than you did with the agents at that time. You, I, I doubt that that's a common thing for undercover operatives. I, I think what is common is there's all these different elements and personalities. The one common factor amongst all the guys that are great mm -hmm. is they're audacious. That there's, there's some that have various levels of risk assessment, various levels of courage, uh, various looks, various experiences, understanding of the trade craft, all those things. But every one of the great ones is yeah. just audacious. Yeah. Can they you just, explain they audacity yeah, they to just me? have, just, they just have the balls fuck yeah. to, yeah. Um, you know, uh, not be afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, be afraid to not try. Yep. Yep. is worse than yep. failing. Yep. It's like Jordan says, man, you, you miss uh, 100% of the shots you don't take. That's right. So, so take your shot, yep. man. And, and, if, and if risk, if, if, if a risk is, is a factor in it, you know, then you're probably not going to be very good at it because everything you do is a risk. 
everything you do is risky. Right. There's no guarantees. Right, right. And would you just like quickly, I just, I, I mean, just, you know, with who, I, I just want people to have an idea kind of who you are. Like you're, you're gonna see very quickly, um, this, this is not my fucking day job. You know, this is not gonna be, uh, this is definitely not uh, uh, Walter Cronkite. It's definitely not fucking David Letterman. But I wanted to, you know, you- um, With all that, I'll dumb it down from there. <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. I, I think, you, you know, for me, I just think it's really important that people know, uh, look, you, you know, kind of who you are and where you're from. Because to me, I feel like, you know, like the books that you've written and um, what you've done in law enforcement in this, in this country and sort of your struggles within law enforcement with the, with the very bureau that you gave so much to, I feel like there's also so much more to you that I, I don't know and I'm, I'm fascinated to find out. But I mean, you infiltrated the Hells Angels and uh, brought probably the biggest case in the history of that organization against them, um, a two-year process uh, that is really, in my opinion, unlike anything that has like ever really been done in law enforcement before. Um, one thing in your book, and your book just resonated with me in so many different ways, and I've read it now multiple times in my life. You know, you start off by saying very specifically, you did not grow up, you didn't get beat up, you didn't grow up struggling for food, you did not. Tell me a little bit about how you grow up and tell me a little bit about your sort of first encounters with violence. Um, because you're a guy who, who, who has encountered violence and sort of like walked into the face of violence uh, with a level of courage that I don't think is uh, uh, like sort of anybody else that we've had here before. You know, when I was a kid, uh -huh. I was the heavyweight champion of sissies. <laughs> and like, the, like, I don't believe that, bro. It's so you also got an NFL contract and played four years of Division One football and total fucking badass on the athletic field. But yeah, go so ahead. I'll tell you, like, I'm uh, I'm a kid. I'm like eight years old. There's a neighborhood bully who's beating the dog crap out of me in my front yard. He's bigger than me, stronger than me. He's got me pinned down. I'm on my back, just smacking the crap out of me. And I hear the screen door open on our house, and I'm like. My, like my dad's here, my, my, my hero's here. He's coming to the rescue, right? And I hear, I can't see him, but I hear my dad behind me saying, keep hitting him. And I'm like, wait a minute, man, keep hitting him. <laughs> and and the, the bully like kind of like is, is confused. And my dad's like, keep hitting him. Hit him like you hit him before I came out. And the kid starts smacking me again. And my dad's like, Jay, are you gonna fight back? Are you going to do something? Are you just going to lay there and take a beating? And I'm like, Dad, he's too big. He's too strong, right? So the guy takes a few more blows, gets up, and the kid runs off. He's, like, freaked out like his, you know, someone's father's watching him kick his son's ass, <laughs> yeah. right? I remember my dad came over, and he picked me up, and my nose was bleeding. And he's like, you have to learn to fight back because if you don't, you're going to be a victim for the rest of your life. Mm. There's always someone bigger and stronger out there than you. You have to fight back no matter what. Like that was like, like almost as an eight year old, wow. like I was turned. Wow. I was like, you know, and my dad like was my hero, is my hero. He's mm -hmm. the best man I've ever known. Mm -hmm. uh, the best man I ever hoped to know. Mm -hmm. um, like all these lessons in life that like that was hard for him. Sure. You know, and of he course. picked me up and he ruffled my hair and then he's like, now let's go in and get some ice on that lip. Yep. You know, and it like for a dad, man, that's hard, like hard, hard to do. Super hard. Anybody that's, that's got a kid. Sure. Like, like now putting myself in, in my dad's shoes at that sure. point, I'm like, that was really hard for him. But that yeah. was like a, like a, a teaching moment. Like, Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to raise like a, a good man. Sure. Sure. And do you, and, and did that, did, did that change things the next time that, that, that something, what, was it acute? What, what, was that change? Did you something know, get ignited in you? It changed it? in a, in a, in kind of in a bad way in that when I, uh, when I did punch back and when I did learn to fight back, sure. got carried away. Huh? I, I kind of liked it. Yeah. I liked being on the other side of it. Sure. And that's just as dangerous. Of course. Being, uh, like a bully's a bully. Course. Good guy's side or bad guy's side. Of course, of course. Um, and so... And was, there, was there anything your old man did to kind of curb that in you? Like, did he ever see that side of you? Did he ever did he ever ask you to pull back on that or get you to see yourself in a different way? I, I think that um, what he saw and what he enjoyed is like when I became involved in sports, sure. the recklessness that that creates, yep. that's how you play sports, especially yep. when you're an underachiever, especially when you're undersized and under speed and, and under strength. Yep. Like, how do you make up? How do you compete against those people 
that have all these physical right. like gifts that yep. you don't have, you just you're reckless. Describe yourself as a receiver. You know the the, the way that you describe yourself in 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 the book. Um, I'd like to say on a much sort of smaller level, not even closer. It's exactly how I used to describe myself as a receiver, as being sort of an underachiever, not the fastest, not the strongest, but that's actually a position that I think is usually sort of goes hand in hand with the glory or the fast guy, you're burning them deep. But you know, the, the kind of receiver, I, I love crack back blocks. I loved uh, short yard receptions. Yeah. I love dragging people over to get that first down. I love hitting people as that position. Can you sort of describe yourself as a football player? Yeah, exactly that I, I tried to make up for my shortcomings by just playing wild playing reckless trying to be fearless um, I was never the guy who ran down the sidelines and and uh, caught the ball over his shoulder and scored a touchdown and got a date with the prom queen right, 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 right. right? I was the guy who like ran the slant to get the first down so the other cat that's could right. catch the touchdown and that's date right. the prom queen that's right but I was all I was super proud of that absolutely I knew what my role was it was not to be the star it sure. was not to be uh like the glory guy sure. my role was very defined and very specific and I embraced it and that's how I stayed on the field and how do you feel like and you 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 carried that you know you were a star player in 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 high school they took you to university of arizona played you know division one college football you know got 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 looks from the nfl i mean how did how did the mentality of football i know you're you're coaching today how did like how did football sort of shape you for your career and how did it what what lessons did you learn from it yeah it's just it's such a i don't think there's any sport that teaches you life's lessons as well as football Agreed. does um, and all the things that come with it, and not just the sport, not just the tactics and the techniques of it, but the teamwork Team, of it yeah. and, and the coordination that it takes and like knowing your role and, and understanding your hierarchy um, in the process, that, that's, man, that's life. Yep. That's, you know, football, like, like acting or producing a film, like uh, an undercover operation, maintaining a, just a relationship, a personal relationship, running a family, a yep. small business, a yep. big business, we all have the same process. This, and, and look, maybe we don't even really, if you haven't thought about it, we don't really understand it. To be like the people that are truly successful in life, the highest achievers are the best problem solvers. That's right. So whatever is in front of you, identify whatever that objective is. What's the mission? What's the goal? Then the next step is communication with the people around you, open transparent communication where you're exchanging ideas. When you do that, you build trust because you, because now you're part of a team. And then with all those things in line, now you can go solve whatever problem X is, sure. whether it's in your relationship, whether it's boy girl stuff, yep. whether it's managing kids or yep. a wife or a husband, making a movie, yep. run an undercover operation, small business, big business. It's like our process is the same. Sure. And like, if you don't think about it, like all of us spend our entire day solving problems. That's right. That's right. And the people that are, are super high achievers are really good at it. And, 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 I, and you know, you're talking, the way that you're sort of uh, able to put that now is coming from a place of just being an enormously high achiever yourself and looking back on this sort of unparalleled career. But I, I, I'm really interested in the guy, like before you went into the ATF, before you decided to become an undercover operative, you know, w there's a level like you, you use the word recklessness, right? Like I, I, I like to think of that. Um, it's, it's what attracts me uh, again in a much different sort of way it's like to the acting. Look, man, <laughs> again, there's no words for the life that you you've lived. And I guess I'm really interested, you know, in this guy who decides to, 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 to make a life of uh, being an undercover operative in the most dangerous of situations. Where were you sort of like with violence and recklessness at that point in your life? Well, you know, I'll tell you, uh, the honest truth is I'm very much a common man who's been placed in uncommon situations mm -hmm. and then just done the best I could mm -hmm. in that situation, mm -hmm. um, found some success at times and failed and failed made total. mistakes yep. a lot yep. of times yep. too. Yeah. Um, you know, and if, and if we don't talk about the mistakes and mm -hmm. if we don't talk about the failures, then, then there's, then what I say doesn't have credibility. Agreed. If all we do is like tell hero stories totally. and pat myself on the back. Totally. Um, and try to uh, like build upon some uh, myth, mm -hmm. then it's all counterfeit. But but what makes it, I mean, what, what were you hungry for? You know, this decision to go into the ATF and go into this world and wanting to be into, like what was it about that that was, you know, drawing you in? 
the uh, the intrigue of it, the challenge, uh, like the kind of the one on one challenge, the competition of it, undercover work, you're in competition. It's a competition of you versus either uh, the, the suspect you're working on, the group you're working on, yeah. you're competing with them and they're yeah. competing against you. Yeah. Um, the criminal community is uniquely paranoid and they have to be because that's how they stay out of prison. Yep. They don't trust you. They don't like strangers. And so there's a competition there. You're tr like, I'm trying to sell myself. Sure. It's, it's, it's Jordan Belfort. It's, it's sure. Wolf of Wall Street. Sure. Sell me this pen. Sure. Well, I'm the pen. Yep. Like I'm selling you. Yep. Like, trust me, believe you don't know me. You don't have any experience with me. You didn't grow up with me. Sell me your drugs. Sell That's me right. your guns. Sell me your bombs. Involve me in your home invasion scheme. Hire me to do the murder you want done. Yep. Yep. Selling me. Yep. Yep. And building that credibility. It's all about building that. That is basically your coat of armor, right? Like that is how you do that. And is admitting your failures, is that part of building your credibility? Is is being exactly who you are? I, I mean, I really want to talk about, you know, how you work with CIs and how you how, how you sort of like build this 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 role. But um, you know, look, man, I mean you're one of your first outings out there, you 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 got shot, right? And and uh, can you take us through that story? And I know you don't want to just tell hero stories, but it, that, I'm, it's a crazy fucking story. So, and, and I'm going to tie this to, uh, to, your, to your HBO show right now. There's, a, there's a tie in here, right? Please. Uh, to We Own the City. Love it. Um, I got hired on a Monday, 1987. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was a failed athlete. I'd like, I, I, I had always planned on playing in the NFL. Yep. Um, and then I, I never had a plan B. I never planned for anything other than that because that's what I was going to do. Well, you know, it turns out like, dude, you ain't good enough to play in the NFL, right? So you like, so now you're left like a lot of young people. Now what? Right? So at the time, this is mid 80s. Miami Vice was popular. Yep. And as an audience, we had never seen a cop show like that. Right. We had seen all the procedurals, detectives responding reactively to crime scenes, doing interviews, patrolmen, right? And then all of a sudden, Sonny Crockett shows up on the scene and Playing he's like, role. got the Hugo Boss on, he's yeah. riding a Lambo around South Beach, right? And he's he's uh, going into these mansions and he's meeting with these glamorous kingpins and there's a ton of cocaine out on some barge in the harbor. And he's got these like stripper models bringing him mojitos, right? And I'm like, <laughs> man, I like that seems pretty cool, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> The reality of it is, what I found, the reality is that that Lamborghini it was like a, a beat down Monte Carlo, sure. right? And the Hugo Boss suit was like cut off camos and a wife beater t-shirt and flip flops. Right, right, right. The the kingpin that, that Sonny Crockett was dealing with was some like broke dick dude who didn't have two nickels to rub together that was sitting at the end of the bar with his plumber's crack hanging sure. out, right, right. right? The ton of cocaine. It was an eight ball that was so stepped on with baby laxative, you'd shit before you'd get high off of it, right? And then the, the, the stripper models that like you see on TV that are like running with these cats, they're like straight skanks with like three teeth in their head and right. tits like sweat socks with rocks in the toes. And so when I, when I experienced it, and it was so much different than what Hollywood had sold me on, sure, sure. I, I fucking loved it yeah. every day, man. <laughs> Every day I loved it. It wasn't glamorous. Yeah, yeah. Undercover work is a nasty, dirty, bloody, vomit-covered scab of a life. Yep. And when I realized that, I still loved it, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. And what was it that you loved? I loved the challenge of it. I yeah. loved the competition of it. I loved how dirty it was. Yep. Yep. I didn't have to be the guy with the gold chains and the Rolex and all the, and all the you know, driving the, the Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I didn't care. I'd, I'd show up like on a bicycle for right. deals, right? Ride, ride a bike because that's, that's how some of those cats roll. How early in the career was that, 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 that first event where you got wounded? That, well, so like I get hired on a Monday. Yeah. Right. So I actually was out here in Los Angeles, got okay. sworn in and I told my supervisors, I want to work undercover. I came to work undercover. Sure. So supervisor digs in his desk and he hands me a cassette tape and some headphones. And all it said on it was Marty, right? So I plug it in and I'm listening. What it was, was the audio recording of a Baltimore City, Baltimore Police Department narcotics officer named Marcellus Ward, Marty Ward. Holy shit. Who Marty in December of 1984 
was in an undercover deal with a heroin uh, dealer and was shot like five or six times point blank in a drug dealer's apartment. And Marty in Baltimore, in Baltimore Uh and Marty dies on tape. Marty, like Marty dies with his boys trying to rescue him on. You hear him die. Right. So. So the guy shot him left, and then you hear his backup unit come in trying to save him. Yeah, and it Fuck. is, dude. I'll, I'll send you the recording. Mm. It's, it, it's it's mm-hmm. it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to yep. listen to, right? Yep. So, I co- I come out. I'm listening to tape. My my boss is like, "Hey, man, you still want to work undercover?" I'm like, "Yeah, man. This dude's a freaking hero. Like, I'm not I'm not gonna die doing it, right. but right." So, four days uh-huh. later, I get I get, I get hired. I want to work undercover. They, they make me listen to the Marty tape. They're trying to like, hey, dude, you need to know what you're getting into, right? Four days later, I get taken hostage and shot. Um, a, the bullet went in my back. It went in uh, between my... Uh, can, you, can you just... How did you get, how did you get taken hostage? So the, actually, it's, there's, there's so many stories and backstories to everything, right? I know, I know. So, I know. so like I'm brand new. And like, I've, I haven't been to the academy. I don't have any training. Um, I, I, I wasn't a street guy, right? So I'm like on the, the outer tertiary, like most distant perimeter sure. of this arrest operation. Sure. sure. The suspect shows up. He shows up on a motorcycle, gets off his motorcycle, parks in front of his house, starts walking in. Boom, boom, boom. All the units, all the, all the surveillance units start swooping in on him to, um, to make the arrest. Sure. Well, he, he takes off. He yeah. takes off running. And so I'm like, I'm in so far in the distance. Like, I'm supposed to just be staying out of the out of the work. Right. I see the cat running. Well, I start running. Right. So, like, I, was, I wasn't I was fast enough to play in the NFL. Right. I was slow for the NFL. Wide receiver. But I was freaking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, Usain Bolt for in Fuck Copland. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I start, like, I'm passing dudes and chasing. We're running through the neighborhood. And he's yeah. serpentine and zigzagging. Yeah, and, yeah. And I and I lose the dude. He vanishes. Yeah. He knows where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Yeah. Um. Short time later, like we're we're just kind of searching, creeping for the dude. And, he and are was, you still? Do you still have your guys around you? Or are you they're like we're all spread out, out. Okay. distant, mm-hmm. right? So everybody's like, you know, there's the, like no one's really nearby or close. Um, and the dude was hiding, man, and he popped up and and drew down on me, and I like I had my gun, and he was like, "Motherfucker, I will fucking kill you where you stand," right? And I'm like, you know, I don't remember seeing this uh, episode of my Advice, Advice, right, right, right. right. The dude gets behind me, puts the gun to my head, and 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 um, he puts his gun to your head, right? And he says, "I'll kill you where you stand." Has anybody ever said that to you in your life? That had anybody drawn a gun on you before in your life? No. So now there's a gun at your head. What do you fe- what, what are you feeling, man? Well, like I didn't have uh, like those types of life experiences to refer back to. Like, right. okay, what do I do now? Right. But there, but there is a sports element to it. There is a like a football element to yeah. it. Things are breaking bad. There's chaos. There's panic, sure. man. You're sure. losing the game. You don't help yourself by becoming hysterical. Right. You find your you find your zen. You find a sense of calm, and you try to like let your computer run. You know. Let the but computer you, work. I mean, have you ever seen anyone else with that little experience go to that place? I mean, or, or, I, I mean, I imagine it's like you were specifically wired that way, both you know from football, the, you, you know the blood that your, your your mom and dad put in you. You know, I mean, not most people. Most people get a gun to their head like that, and I mean, they're pissing their pants, right? They're not getting tactical. You got you, you took a breath and got tactical. And again, it's not hero worship, nothing like that. I'm just wondering what is going through your your head. I mean, a, a gun was once put, put put you know put to my head once in in, in Russia, and and I knew into I felt like I was this like I, I, I immediately turned into a buck. Right. I was literally like you. I, I, I'm here for you. I'll do whatever you want. I'm just wondering what went through your because I, I, I look. I know this story. I want you to tell the rest of the story. Right. But like, wh- how do you go tactical at that point? Um, cause I mean, I, you didn't have a ton of training, right? No, I had no training, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's an inherent survival instinct. Like, like panic's going to get me nowhere. Yep. Panic's going to get me shot. Yep. Like right now. Yep. Um, in, in any kind of situation, like th- those life and death situations, if you're talking, if you're communicating, you're alive, you're yep. still in the game. Yep. yep. Just keep moving. Right. Keep like, keep thinking, keep planning. Okay. And, so what happens next? So 
the dude uh, has got the gun to my head and uh, I talked about this old, like I, like I thought I was coming on the job to this Lamborghini, right? Like <laughs> this old Monte Carlo, right? That we'd use to show up there. Yeah. He stuffs me in the front seat of the Monte Carlo. He gets behind me and he's got the gun to my head. Um, and he's like saying like, go, like get, get me out of here. Right? Like, like he, like he wanted to use me as his vehicle to escape the situation. Well, now the other agents are starting to close in. Right? So I'm thinking like, you know what, man? This, this probably has got a bad ending, but like, I'm not going to drive this dude away from here with all these other agents, all these other armed agents. I'm not going to drive this dude away from here and, and have him kick me out and execute me in right. the ditch 20 miles down and the you, road. You knew that that was what was coming, yeah. right? I was like, like, if this is going down, it ain't, it's going down and now. And were you playing the, the audio, I mean, in your head? I mean, did you go back to the, to the Baltimore undercover agent? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, right? I'd only heard that tape a couple days uh, before, right? So yeah. it was like that, that story was super fresh in my mind. Yeah. And, and, and Marty's demise and, and ugh, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there and I'm sitting behind the wheel and I see a, telephone pole like 30 yards up in front and the first thing i thought is like i'm gonna buckle my seatbelt and i'm gonna run us into that telephone pole as hard as i can get this car going as fast as i can get it going and that's that's gonna at least give me a chance right, right. so i'm going to buckle my seatbelt, and the keys are in the ignition of the of the car and i'm like okay plan b man i pulled the keys out and i dropped them to the floorboard and he's screaming at me like, let's go, let's go. Let's, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's messed up. Sure. Um, and I reach forward to grab the keys. And when I, he tried to ride forward with me and the gun came off my head, the gun actually moved to my back. He's trying to stay with me and ride me. Right. And he's holding the gun on my back and then everything Crazy. breaks bad. He fires around, um, hits me in the back, goes through my lung narrowly misses my heart exits my chest um and then that inspires like literally uh this lead and glass storm like that that you could only imagine in a movie right right it was like it was five or ten seconds i think like 20 or 25 rounds were fired into the car right into the into the compartment we were in um so i brought this because i because i knew that story would come up holy right? shit so that hole right there, wow. that's where the bullet went in my back. Come on, man. Right? And this hole right here, Literally that hole right out. there is where it came out of my came out of my chest. Wow. Right? So, like I said, got hired on a Monday. Like this goes down four days later on a Thursday with the feds. John, we get paid every two weeks. I didn't even gotten a paycheck <laughs> yet, man. I didn't get a I comped him this one. This was on the house, man. This was like a test drive. Like, hey, man, can I try? Can I come back tomorrow? <laughs> right? And there was like, I mean, I'm laying in the dirt and dog crap of this trailer park. Yeah. And there's blood coming out of my chest like you're holding your thumb over the end of a garden hose. Yeah. Just squirting out. And then they dragged the suspect out of the back of the car because he, I mean, they ventilated yeah, this dude, gone. man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his eyes are rolled back. He's already got the death rattle going. And um, so they push me now into the back seat of this car, and I'm like, and I'm I'm in bad yeah, shape myself. Yeah, yeah. And so the same car that the shooting took place in, we take off for the hospital. Holy um, fuck! And so like, and my boss was driving, who was like a good, experienced, like old school cop, and he's driving and hauling ass, and he's looking over his shoulder into the back seat, like, hang on, hang. He's called everybody Bubba. Hang yeah. on, Bubba. Yeah, hang yeah. on, Bubba. Stay yeah. with me, Bubba. Yeah. And then he's driving and driving and driving. And he's like, man, do you know your way? Do you know the way to the hospital? Because we were down. This <laughs> and I'm like, I got blood gushing out of my chest and like glasses all in me. Right. And I'm like, like, like my ears are bleeding. What and like, fuck? so, but you know what? Um, it has a really, it has a really happy ending. It has a good ending. Actually, the, the trauma surgeon that, that operated on me was a guy named Dr. Richard Carmona. Okay. Um, and he was this young, like super hot shot trauma surgeon, right? So he patches me up. He saves my life. Dr. Carmona ultimately becomes the Surgeon General of the United States under President Bush. Wow. Um, and is just is a is a, a remarkable, re amazing man. Wow. Amazing life's wow. experiences. Wow. Um, so 
Like, like, what's the chance that this all goes down and then I land in the hands the best of the doctor. top yeah, 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 trauma yeah, yeah. surgeon yeah. on the planet? Yeah, yeah. Right? There's hit that, like, you had man, more to do, man. There's always a silver lining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then the decision, I mean, just because I, 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 I got to ask, was there any doubt? I mean, was there was there any like I don't know if this is for me? Like what? Like I, I mean, you 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 jump right back in, correct? Well, so I'm in the hospital and I'm and I'm recovering, and like the uh, the ambulance chaser attorneys are lining up. Like it's like uh, like trying to return something at Home Depot. Like, hey, take a number, man. I'm now right. serving number seventeen. Right. right? right they right. were all taking their turn and they were coming in saying, "Dude, you haven't been trained." The, the government, the agency has assumed a huge amount of liability for allowing this to happen to you. How much money do you want? And I'm like, like I, I mean, I grew up in a blue collar house, man. Yeah, my dad yeah. was a carpenter. Right. And my mom was a house cleaner. Right. Um, they're like, you ever seen $5 million? Wow. And I'm like, no. Yeah. How about $10 million? You know what that looks like? I can get you money that's generational money. Like you'll never have to work another day in your life. Neither will your kids or their kids if Did you're you have smart babies with yet? this. You didn't have kids I didn't. Yet. Right, right. Um, like, like your family will be taken care of forever. And all I could think of was like, like get out. Fuck like out there's no, there's no cop who ever took a badge and a gun, thinking that they were going to get rich. Right. Thinking that they were going to. You take it for other reasons. Right. Right. And. And so the money, the money set, like now at 60, I'm thinking like, man, you know what? <laughs> 35 years ago, man, I could have done a lot of money with a, with a lot with that money over 35 yeah, yeah, years, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But at the time I was like, man, get like, all I wanted to do was get back to work. I, I understand the honor in that. And I, I, I understand, but, but, but what was driving you? Like if you could, if you could whittle it down to one thing, like what was, what was the desire to get back to work? What was the desire? Cause I mean, you still need to learn this trade yeah. and you basically have suffered at this point pretty much the worst i mean i would imagine losing a partner or losing somebody w would be right but but i mean you know you 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 kind of face the ultimate what was it that was driving you to get into that i mean was it this this this, this oath that you took was it you really want to catch bad guys I mean, you talked about miami but like right. what was it failure yeah i'd failed did, I didn't... did you look at that day as a failure yep you did how so yep. um the fact that i was brand new um that like by my own mistakes, by my own errors in judgment, by my own inability to assess risk, I had I had created the situation. No one asked me to come off the perimeter and chase this cat down, right? So I felt like I was embarrassed. Wow. I was um, beyond embarrassed. I was humiliated. Wow. I, like I was the um, I was the joke at the water cooler. Hey man, did you hear about this dude in Tucson? He was on the job four days and he almost got smoked. Wow. Freaking had a through and through like wow. it was humiliating. How how common is it for uh, uh, an undercover agent or or, or or you know what whatever it was that you were doing at that point? I mean, I, th I think there's like a real misconception about sort of the dangers that are out. There. I mean, how how common is it for for an officer like that to get shot? Um, well, in today's world mm -hmm. versus like 1987, it was very uncommon. In today's world, every day we're reading about some cop getting shot. Yeah. Yeah. And and not like on a, on a drug deal. Right. We're talking about like dudes getting, getting sniped, ambushed. getting yeah. ambushed, yeah. 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 right? Getting uh, getting squared off on traffic stops. And it's almost like the patrolmen are. The, it's like the most dangerous job now. It's yeah, like, it's, it's yeah. Like, it's yeah. never been harder to be a cop than it is right now. So when you go back in, then is there a new commitment to training? I mean, is that sort of like is that what the next stage of your life is? Is it just like train your ass off? I knew I could do it, but. Um, like, so like my, my previous plan A was to play professional football, play in the NFL, right? Fail, didn't make it, didn't achieve it. Go to plan B right off the bat, fail. I'm like, man, like I got to break this cycle. 99.9% .9 of people would say, hey, fuck, man. I, I, I played four years, you know, University of Arizona. I got, you know, NFL looks like that. That doesn't sound like a failure to me, but 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 what about you made it look that way? Just because your mindset was I'm going all the way with this? Yeah, and I think that like just my personality is I'm I'm self-critical. Um, I do you think uh, you need to be self-critical in order to be successful? I, I personally do. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I I am very rarely pleased or satisfied with anything I accomplish, Still? and I always find the mistake or the flaw yep. or the error. Yep. Um, 
is that good or bad? Man, I don't know. I don't know I'll tell you that. Like, I think we both know people that uh, uh, achieve on a marginal level, and they'll tell you how amazing Fucking they are a. and how pat fabulous they are, yeah, and they'll yeah, yeah. pat themselves on the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, would and some of them actually seem pretty happy. Sometimes I'm like, well, fuck, man. Maybe I ought to just yes. do that, man. Ain't that They're the fucking truth. enjoying the weekends while I'm working. You know Ain't what I mean? The They're truth. with their kids and fucking living life. You know? Yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. And so, so, you know, I just want to go. I, I, I mean, I know then, you know, the next 20 years of your life are dedicated to this, you, you know, just sort of unparalleled, un, uh, uh, undercover career. And obviously, you know, most of the notoriety, it goes to what you did with the Hells Angels. But I mean, there were so many criminals that and so many criminal, you know, enterprises that you infiltrated. And I guess I'm wondering, like, you know, we talked a little bit about like building credibility. And I re I'm really, really interested in that, like how you do that and how you did that. And so basically, because I know when you kind of came onto the Angels task, you you know, you weren't really a motorcycle gang guy, right? Like you were basically, you had this role, right? You were like a hitman. Like, like what was, I was not the right choice. Why case. is that? When the, uh, when the opportunity came to work the hell's angels case, the case agent approached me and said, Hey, I want you to lead this undercover operation. And my first response was I can name 10 guys off the top of my head who will serve this role for you better than I will. Um, they were guys who that was what they focused on. That's what their expertise was. They were, um, they, they, they had built themselves and, and their experience towards that. I hadn't. Meaning they had spent the bulk of their career sort of in the outlaw biker communities. They already had connections in those communities. Exactly. What, were, what was your, where were you at at that point? Like Dude, what was your guy? I was like, and, and I recycled this cover story over and over. I was just this white trash, peckerwood, debt collector, gun runner, uh, quasi hitman at times. Um, and like I could recycle that over and over and over again. I could play that and make it. I could sell it. I don't care if you're a white collar guy on Wall Street or if you were uh, pushing everything you own in a shopping cart. Like I could find a way to make that fit and sell it to what you needed in the criminal world. And how do you sell it? Like, uh, like well, first of all, like and 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 you know this from like probably from your early days when you had to audition for films, right? When you had to go read, when you're trying to get started, you get one chance at a first impression. That's it. And you better hit it, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't make a good first impression, are you dead in the water? Probably not, but now you've put yourself behind the eight ball, man. Now you gotta recover just to get back to even. Right. Can you think of a time where you feel like you didn't make a good first impression? Oh, um, when I didn't make a good first impression, probably with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> right put myself behind the eight ball and had to make a comeback you know that's but all that, of our stories brother yeah, we're if all that right goals there. out there if you've yeah. got your eyes set on keep something you will keep going straight up bro straight up but but i i guess what i'm wondering is like this this character jay bird david like is that who he was like was he a specific guy like how well did you know this guy that you were playing there's in my experience there's three types of like undercover uh operators that like are the high-end guys um, I'm not talking about like drive through the park and put your hand out and some kid's gonna drop a crack rock and right. like 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 to anybody. Right. Right. There's um, there's the actors who like put on a costume, whatever that role is, and they inherit that persona and they're acting through it. Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, but that's mostly used for like sort of street level. I'm doing this today to achieve this today not building a persona in order, if I meet this guy, he tells this guy, then you get to meet that guy, you're finally gonna get to your target, yeah. right? Which is a much different level. Yeah. So there's there's people that just like, they almost put on a costume and inherit that, they, they start acting in that role. Then there's like the hustler, who we all know, who's just like like a used car, car salesman. He sell anybody anything, man. He's the guy that can sell ice to Eskimos, man. And he's just, and he's always on the hustle, Yeah. right? And then there's like somewhere in between there is just the naturals. And I like, I, I consider myself in that. What you see is what you get. Yeah. Um, I, didn't, I didn't pretend to be something I wasn't. Um, I, I didn't communicate with people I was working on or against any different than I'm talking to you. Sure. Like, and, and you might like me or you might not like me, mm -hmm. but like, but I'm not acting and I'm not pretending to be uh, something I'm not. This is just who I am. So the 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 key in undercover work is like what value can you bring to whoever it is that you're targeting mm. if if 
like for the Hell's Angels. There's a million dudes who have Harleys that are sitting at the bar at the at the end of the bar with long hair and earrings and tattoos who would cut off a, an arm to wear a Hell's Angels patch. They're not interested in those dudes right. because there's a million of those guys. Right. What, what's your value? What do you bring to the table? Mm. Can you make money? Can you earn? Uh, can you enforce? Uh, can you intimidate? You know, like 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 what level of violence are you comfortable with? All those things that come into play that ended up like in the Hell's Angels example of trying to make myself valuable to them. Was the focus on the Hell's Angels at that time, was that because of the big shootout with the Mongols? Is that sort of like what... Is that what's kind of sparked that that major interest, or was there has there always been? There was two main events that really inspired that case, like really getting steam. Uh, the Hell's Angels Mongols riot at the Harris Casino in Laughlin, um, and uh, the Hell's Angels in Mesa had murdered uh, a woman, an innocent woman. They they that was in their clubhouse, right? Yeah, they basically recruited her off the street to come to a party. The party got out of hand. Uh, she mouthed off in the wrong place at the wrong time, man. You don't talk shit on these dudes in their clubhouse, and you don't insult, you, you don't insult them. Um, she took a beating in the Mesa clubhouse. They beat her down, um, and then they stuffed her in the trunk of a car and drove her from Mesa out to Apache Junction, Arizona, which is further east, um, and cut her head off. Um, so that body was recovered, and that, that there was a tie to the Hell's Angels. Then with the riot, then it was like, look, like we got to do something. The riot was super inspiring because it took place in a public venue. So like gang on gang violence and, and when they keep it within their world, like how much can you contain that or right. can control that? These guys are going to fight, man. They're going to get it on. Right. But when it spills into the public, when it spills into a, a venue where there's common man citizen there, it's, it's hard to ignore. And so for you, I mean, and you got to know very well a lot of the people involved in both of those situations and i guess you know when we go back into building credibility and 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 you and your team you, you know you guys you guys uh you you know kind of join the ranks of this this nomad biker gang and then when you finally make this approach to the angels you know and you talk about building this credibility and building this i mean you you guys had this whole you know, you guys were your own motorcycle club. Like, yeah. how, how, how do you go about building that? What are the tools that you need to do that? Yeah, well, like I said, like, we couldn't just show up and right. be like uh, the common man, average Joe coming off the street. Like, you don't knock on these dudes' front door and ask for an application. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. Right? So my cover story, I used the cover story I'd always used. Um, I was a gun runner. I could make that make sense to him. I how do you make that make sense to him? I, uh, I obtain... Uh, guns in Arizona, cross them into the border in Mexico where they're worth 10 times as much, where the cartels will pay 10 times as much for that gun. It's reverse drug trafficking, right? It's, 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 is it's that still movement. true today? It, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Makes sense to them. Like, yeah, that, you know, uh, that was easy. Um, I use my debt collector role. Like I've always got money. I've always got jobs. I've always got work. I've got money in my pocket. I'm not a guy that you're going to have to float. Yep. Um, and then, that like the 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 culmination of that like the violence aspect to it like i started getting solicited to do murders right um because like i never sold myself as a hitman i never told one of those dudes like hey man i kill you know, i'm a contract killer right. i kill people for money right. they assume based on my persona how i carried myself my cover story and then the experience they had with me like this guy will kill someone yeah you know, get approached for it. Like, hey, I'm going to take this dude out. Well, you know. And, and, and you also, you have to do a lot of work with criminal informants. And, 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 and I just, I'm just wondering, a, a big part of what you do, I guess where I'm trying to get at, a, a big part of what you do, I imagine, is you got to get close to people and you got to form like real, honest, genuine relationships with them. And, you, you know, this guy pops. I know you guys got like enormously close. And, he was, and, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, you probably had to get close, really close with people who repulsed you and who you were disgusted by. And I imagine you also got close with people that you genuinely liked and cared for and you genuinely saw like a level of decency in it, whether they're a criminal or not. I'm wondering if you can give me sort of like an example of both of those. Yeah, you're, um, so, so you're presenting this false persona of who you are to people. And, and right off the bat, you're lying to them. Um, but you can never undercover 
out of the human factor. Um, so you're you're actually you have people targeted and and for various reasons, but they're ultimately they're still human beings. And so, like in the Hell's Angels case, for example, every second of every day wasn't spent in some kind of criminal activity with these guys. So they would be you know running their scheme or doing whatever they're doing, and you see that and you become a witness to that. But you're also spending downtime with them, sure. social time with sure. them. You know, in their homes, in their living rooms. Holding their babies. Meals. That's it. Eating with them. Yep. Sleeping at their house. Have They're sleeping at your house. Shooting pool with them. Drinking beer with them. Like just, and you see like these redeeming qualities in their personalities. And Can you give me like, an example? Um, just guys that like you run around with and you're like, man, like I like this guy. Yeah. And you know what? If someone came in here and uh, busted a bottle on the back of my head, I'm this dude out. would be throwing down for me. That's right. Right, That's like right. like though you build those That's kind real. of relationships. Yep. Um, the problem is, is God does not build us to inherently plan on betraying someone. And in undercover work, you know from the very beginning, like I'm going to try to make a good first impression. I'm going to try to gain your trust. I'm going to gain your loyalty. Ultimately, in some cases, I'm going to gain your love. And no one in the back of your head. And as I'm building this man, I am going to, it's going to be a bad day for you, man. Ultimately. I, I, cause Ultimately, I am going to betray you. Yeah. And, 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 and I find that so interesting. You, you talked about how you were sort of like this pit bull dog and slitting your, 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 your sort of superior who was kind of running the show had to kind of hold you back a little bit. And I'm wondering, it's like, how do you, how did you manage to have, I mean, you have so many things going at once, right? Like you have this burning desire to take these guys down, but at the same time, you're also getting in some cases extraordinarily close with them and finding things that you bond with things that you respect about them sometimes uh, you, you love some of these guys but at the same time you're also trying to maintain your own real love for 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 for, for your family and preserving them the job and the oath that you took and 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 i can only imagine i mean obviously that 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 sounds fucking insanely stressful whatever but i mean i'm just wondering like how do you how do you maintain the real you do you maintain the real you is it compartmentalization? Like, how does that work? Well, we've hit on this uh, topic a couple of times. Uh, I failed at that. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably my, my biggest regret. My biggest humiliation or embarrassment is that I, I, I was in this undercover role for, for so long, for such an extended period of time, like well before and, and beyond the Hells Angels case, that J. Bird Davis, the gun runner, debt collector, hitman, stopped becoming what I did for a living and it started becoming who I was. But wasn't, but, the, but, but that was necessary, correct? It, 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 in, in, in order to accomplish what you accomplished. Well, and, and, and that was, at least that was my, my defense to myself and to my wife. Yep. I was like, you know what? People that treat this as a gimmick, people that treat what I do as a hobby end up dead. Yep. Right, I have to be all in, I 100%, because I'm gonna get killed if I'm not. Right. I, I had an argument with my wife. At one point I came home, I'd been away from the house for an extended period of time. I walk in, like, like Jay Bird Davis walks into my house, right? Oh, yes. And she's like, you cannot be gone and come here and treat me and our kids and talk to us like we're street people. Right. And I was like, I'm not a light switch. Right. I can't turn this on mm -hmm. and off. And she's like, well, when you come to this house, you better install a dimmer and <laughs> dial that attitude down or I'll don't come you. back. Straight up. And, and I, was like, I was super pissed off about that. Mm -hmm. I was like, don't you know I'm saving the mm -hmm, world? Mm -hmm, don't mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. I'm doing all these Ain't amazing things? Yep, yep. And, like, and you're going to give me shit for mm -hmm, it? Mm -hmm. She was exactly right. She was 100% justified. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's such a, le I, I, I guess, uh, because I know how committed you are to your family I, I see your relationship and I just in two seconds and I, I, I uh, and what you said about like chasing that eight ball and making up for lost time it's such a it's such a I think a meditation on fatherhood to begin with because I just know through your book you know you talked about all these kids that you would sort of come upon in the field you would go into these houses where people are doing meth and they're they're fucking right in front of their kids or selling drugs in front of their kids there's violence right in front of these kids and you, you're seeing these these young girls that are being tossed around you're thinking of your own daughter and like you know i i really believe look man for me 
in this world, first and foremost, I'm a dad. I'm a father and I'm a husband. That is my primary, that is that is my, my North Star, right? And there's times where I have to say, you know, and, but the bottom line is, and I think this is true for guys who are locked up. I think this is true for guys who are overseas. I think it's true for guys who, for whatever reason, they walked away. They walked away. I feel like that love, that 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 bond is always there, and you always have a relationship with it. And and your north star is how healthy that relationship is. And there, there's always a way. And I guess it, it, it seems to me like it was always present. Your son gave you that rock. You kept that rock with you. You know, like what, like I brought, I brought it. Th- you tell look, that man, story. I mean, that's who you are. I mean, right. it's like clear. And I, I guess, like, what lessons on fatherhood did this whole chapter in your life teach you? it's 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 gonna sound my answers are gonna sound like like kind of pathetic almost or like like i'm seeking compassion or sympathy and i'm not because Fair all enough. the decisions i made i made Fucking no one made them for me right. i own all of them yep but it keeps coming back to this element of uh failure or perceived failure like you talked about like above all you're grounded in your wife and your kids right like i lost that man they weren't the most important thing to me um, like I think inherently, like I'm selfish. That's a very unflattering thing to say about yourself. I made decisions for me, about me, what was good for me, what I wanted to do. And I didn't think about my wife and I didn't think about my kids. You're like along for the ride. And I, and I settled that in my head because I was giving them, I was providing them a comfortable life. They had a nice house. They had food, they had clothes, they went to good schools. You know, my wife had a had a good car to drive. They didn't have to worry about money. Like I balanced that by saying, like you're, like I'm giving you a comfortable sure. life, but I wasn't giving them presence. Sure, I wasn't giving yeah. them. Yeah, I I wasn't there, right? I was like I was buying my family. Mm-hmm. I was I was paying for my family by giving them things, and I thought like like somehow that was like love or that was a real relationship. And that, I mean, that's, you know, like we're, t- like we're talking to an audience. Like, I don't, like, I don't know the people out there. Listening to. Sure. That's a pretty humiliating thing to say about yourself. But like we said earlier, if I don't, if I, if I'm not, if I don't come clean, yeah. like yeah. I'm counterfeit then. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and, and also you can't do nothing about nothing until you admit that it's there. I mean, you, you, you'll never address a problem unless you look at it, right? Well, you're, you're like literally when you're like, I was constantly pushing the envelope and I did everything as hard and as fast and as long as I could. And then when the operation was done, like then the fun time came and I partied as hard and as fast and as long as I could. And I, like I pushed, I pushed the envelope every day on everything and, and my relationships. And so, you know, like I retired eight years ago and like the saying, like, uh, it's better to, um, burn out than fade away. Mm. I did both. Mm. I burned out mm. and faded away. Mm. I spend so much time on my couch now. I've been reupholstered twice. <laughs> <laughs> what is your relationship with the kids like now? It's it's really good. I bet. Um, and my relationship with Gwen is really good. I can see that. Um, but I'll tell you what. Of no credit to me, I did every single thing I could direct that. Mm. Um, there was countless times where I should have came home and all my clothes should have been in the front yard and the locks should have been changed. I made a million mistakes with Gwen and my kids and I'm blessed that they've given me a million and one second chances to fix it. Beautiful. Um, and so I'm trying to take that one chance yep. Yep. and trying to like see if I can finally, like on the back half of my life, maybe get it right because I spent the first half of my life getting everything wrong. And when you, when you say that, you know, you were like pushing the envelope in all areas, again, do you feel like that was necessary in, in, in order to, you know, especially when you were, is that the rock? It is. Wow. Wow. Can you tell the story of that rock? So during the course of like, so my kids n- never knew me as anything other than an undercover agent. They were born into it. Like Gwen had a chance, man. She knew what I was doing before we got married. So like, like she had the opportunity to say no. The kids never had an opportunity to say no, right? So like well before the Hells Angels case, through the Hells Angels case, I'd be gone for an extended period of time, you know, smoking and joking, come home. Um, and I did the bare minimum I had to to keep my family functioning. I'd mow the grass, pay the bills, 
pat the kids on the head, have a cup of coffee with Gwen. Couldn't wait to get back out because I loved being in gangster land. What That's did where you love I about thrived. It? I just loved um, like the risk of it, the challenge of it, how dynamic it was, how dangerous it was, um, that like pushing the envelope, right, all the time. So every time I'd come home and then get ready to leave, my son, who was little at time, like eight, 10, run out in the yard and say, dad, don't leave yet. Like I got something for you. And he'd come and he'd bring me a rock out of the yard. And hundreds of times I had these rocks. I, I kept, I kept Jackie's rocks. I kept one in my pocket at all times. I had them in the saddlebags, of my motorcycle, my undercover car, my undercover house, these good luck charms, right? This kid was giving me these good luck charms. Um, I started handing them out to my partners on the task force. I was like, oh, I don't wow. know like what kind of blessing or charm this kid is putting Trust on, me on but this. like <laughs> the violence is swirling around us. Yeah. Eight or 10 murders took place during that case, like oh. all around us, friends of mine, people that I was working on. I was like, like, please hang on to this rock, right? So the last big operation, we're getting ready to kind of wrap the case up and we're going to go fake this murder. Right. And I'm getting ready to leave. And I tell Jackie, like, I'll, I'm almost done. And don't leave yet, dad, don't leave yet. And he brings me this rock. Right. And he, and he, and it's this rock. It's the, the one he, the, the one that I keep with me. And he says, I've been saving this one for you. It's special. It's shaped like a heart. And so like, I'm a 40 year old dad and I'm trying to comfort like this 10 year old boy. And I said, all the things that I have been neglecting with you, I'm gonna fix. I'm gonna get done with this and I'm gonna come home and we're gonna play catch and we're gonna ride bikes and we're gonna wrestle and we're gonna go swim and go to the movies. Right? And I said, it's all because of your rocks, dude. These good luck charms. Yeah. And I'm like, they work so good. I've been giving them to all my partners. And this little boy standing on my driveway and tears start running down his cheeks. He's standing there, no shirt, no shoes. And he's like, those were not good luck charms and you shouldn't have given them to anybody. They were just for you. They were only for you, dad. And so like, I'm like trying to figure out like for years, I thought he'd been giving me good luck charms. And he's like, that's for you to put in your pocket. And every time you think someone's going to hurt you, you could put your hand in there and touch it. And that would be like me being there to help you fight them. Wow. And that was like, that was the worst day and the best day mm. of my life. Mm. The worst day is that a 10 year old boy had to teach his 40 year old father what my job was. Mm. The best day was that my 10 year old son taught me what my job was. Mm. Um, and so, man, I put a huge amount of battle damage on my family. That's what I did to my kids. Yeah. All because what? Because I wanted to be Donnie Brasco part two? Mm. 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 For what? Mm. And then you leave, no one cares, no one remembers you, no one remembers the cases, you know, you, like you, 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 you retire. And the next day, like the people on your task force are arguing over the stapler on your desk, who gets it? That's how, that's how important you are. Right, right, right. And then, you know, ultimately this, 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 this case is like brought against these guys. There's gotta be some feeling of like deep satisfaction. There's gotta, like, what, what is that? What it so, was? So, uh, so I, I, I go through this dispute with my agency after the, after the case, yeah. right? And I felt like uh, the threats that we had faced, that me and my family faced, that weren't addressed, I felt super betrayed by that, sure. right? Um, and I was upset by it. And then, like, the light bulb went off one day and my head cleared and I'm like, dude, like, that was your karma, man. You had it coming. You betrayed your family. You betrayed your wife and your kids for this job. Think about all the people over 27 years that you had investigated, that you won their love and you betrayed them. Like, how you, how's that feel, man? How you like that? And you know, when it happened to me, I didn't like it very much. And, 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 and so once again, you looked at this like, again, what many would look at as this like massive achievement or whatever, but you looked in your life, you looked at the parts that didn't work. You looked at the parts that were a failure. How can I correct this? First of all, these people that you won the love of, and, and you betrayed them, the, 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 these, these criminals that you ended up bringing down or whatever that is. Can you talk about somebody specific that you felt really bad about that, 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 that you came to love that, that, that ultimately you yeah. brought down? You know, like, like I can kind of squeeze that into one story, sure. right? So we like go, we spend two years with these guys and, and meet hundreds of them, right? And indicted 
55 people, 16 of them on RICO. We indicted the guys that had beheaded Cynthia Garcia. Um, so I'm briefing the SWAT team. I'm briefing the raid team for the, for the takedown. And in the process, I'm talking about the different characters that they're going to be hunting and where they're going to be. And, and so, how violent they are and what yeah. to expect. Yeah, of course. And so in it, I'm like, hey, when you hit JoJo, right? right? Like, man... Like the dude's a pretty decent dude, yeah. right? Like, like, like. Look, I know you got to take him down, yeah. But like, like, like this dude, easy, yep. right? Yep. Now, Jimmy, when you hit hit his house, beat, <laughs> yeah, his, beat fucking his fucking balls ass. off, <laughs> yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a fucking asshole. Yeah. And what? And, and can you can, can you describe that line? Like, what is it? Why? What made him an asshole? And what made you love Jim? Well. Love it, probably no different than probably some of them felt about me. Right. It's like it, you, you put a group of people together and there's mm -hmm. some people you click with, mm -hmm. there's other people you don't. Mm -hmm. So um, the people that I disliked probably had, I'm sure had people that absolutely adored them. Mm -hmm. The people that I liked probably had arch enemies. Sure. Um, it was just like the chemistry that I had with certain people, whether it be good or bad, was my chemistry. I, I guess the reason why I ask is, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that I've, become really close with and some folks that we've had on the show who, who've, who've spent a lot of time in law enforcement, not in the capacity that, 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 that you have for these prolonged undercover, these, these huge operations that you've been on. But one thing that I hear over and over again from, 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 from folks in law enforcement, especially when we start to talk about, you know, this kind of anti-police movement that's kind of taken over the country recently and, 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 and all of the videos that we're seeing about police brutality and how it's like changing the course of policing. And one thing that I hear from, from a lot of great cops and guys I really respect is you can't make it personal. Like you, it's business, you can't make it personal. And when you start making it personal, that's yeah. when bad shit. But I think like in your case, what's so fucking astounding to me is like making it personal is kind of everything for you, right? Like you've got to, like pr making it personal is also like your armor. Like you're not get these motherfuckers. No one's getting close to Hell's Angels clubhouses. You're going to New York City. You're making a few phone calls. You're in there fucking an ATF agent. You're in there. Like I talked to Mel Chancy today, who as we were talking to today is one of the most feared Hell's Angels in history, Mr. 187. And he was just like, what you were able to do was like fucking unprecedented. And he said, by the way, he's like, he, they would have never been able to do it to us. He's like, he's like, you were able to talk the talk, walk the walk. You always had money on you. You, you would say you were going to do something, you're going to do it. When violence came up, you threw hands, you were like down to like you. And, and he said that like, look, man, like they, you said you guys fucking killed a Mongol and you showed pictures of it. Like, yeah. you know, what Mel said is, I guess in the Hell's Angels, in order to even think about getting patched in, it's got to be, you got to know somebody for five years, you know? Yeah. They said what, what, what you did was unprecedented. And I imagine it's because you were able to form these personal relationships. And I guess what I'm so... You know, you had to make this personal, correct? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It's It's got to be personal. It's got to be important to you. Um, but on the other side of that, like, so, so operationally, it's very personal, right? But then at some point, the these people that you've grown to, to, to at least like, right, are sitting on the sidewalk in front of their house with their hands cuffed totally. behind their back, right? You have created, I've created the very worst day Ever in that person's life and I'm responsible for it and there I am standing in front of them um, then the personal side comes off I never mocked anybody over sure. the course of my career I never said like I got you see sure. how's that feel I sure. tricked you you sure. fell for it you sure. bought it not one time what is the main emotion I like, was the dude see... who was like dude man you know what today is a freaking terrible day for you man yeah. but <clears throat> like it can be a great day like you like maybe this is what you needed Mel Chancy, right? No better example. No Maybe better this example. is what you needed to get right. Like, man, like, so they're sitting there and they're pissed off and they hate me, right? They want to just rip my throat out. Like, dude, can I get you a cigarette, man? Putting a cigarette in their mouth and, and, and moving it in out of their mouth so they can take a drag. Do you need some water? Let me get you a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. Those small little elements of humanity and compassion. Like, I've had people that I've, that I've arrested that said, you know what, man? I didn't like you. But you always treated me good. That's man. right. You that's always right. treated me like, and, and I think that's the key for any of us, man. Treat totally. people the way you want to be treated in anything, right? right? And, I, and I feel like that's like these great, 
you, 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 you know, these, these great cops that I've, I've gotten to know and love over the years, it's like they all have what you're talking about. It's like empathy, man. It's like, hey, man, therefore the grace of God go I, man. Like I could be in that situation. And there is this fine line. And there's, you know, at the end of the day, man, we're, we're all playing the cards that were dealt. If there was less just sort of forces separating us, say you're on this side, you're on this side. I mean, the way that you were able to ultimately get these guys off the street at a time in their life where they were causing horrible, horrible fucking things. Yeah. The way you were doing it was to be able to say, hey, man, I open my heart up to you. Well, you know, we're both friends with Mel Chansey. Sure. Like, I, I cannot think of a better example. Me neither. This dude was the most dangerous cat on the planet, man, and legit and feared, like, by everyone. And and he earned that. Like, like that wasn't just because he was bigger than everybody. Right. or Like, like he, right. El, Mel yes, earned his reputation. Yeah. Um, and then he has a downturn. He gets caught up in it. Right. And he realized, uh, like probably through that downturn, that God had a bigger plan from him Absolutely. and that he could not fulfill that plan living in a steel cage and eating bologna sandwiches and lime jello for the rest of his life. Right. He had to escape that. Right. And now look at like what he's doing with it's his incredible. life and how he's changing the world it's incredible. and how he's inspiring people towards God. It's incredible. Like, how do you not love that? How do you not love and he And like. He talks about you. He like loves you. You know, he loves the guy. He loves Bayless. You know, like he love. You know, and 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 I guess with that, you know, like what does it say about criminality in general? You know, I, uh, something else in your book that that really hit me, man, was, uh, you know, you, you know, I think it was about that the uh, pops, but it was about like CIs in general, criminal informants, and that you said that, you know, you're really going to folks and you're offering them a chance to do something different, like to 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 have a different kind of purpose, and that a lot of these guys either haven't had that opportunity or they're, they're, they're caught up in the, what can you say sort of about criminal informants in general? And then what can you say sort of about criminality and folks playing the cards that they're, look, they, I think we both know there's some folks that are just deranged and there's some folks that yeah. are just kind of led by a little bit of evil, whatever that is. Yeah. But what can you say about sort of the common criminal and is there, is there another path? Is there another path in just sort of like targeting them, taking them out, incarcerating them? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, I, th I think that uh, a lot of times they end up in the situations they are because they're so desperate, they can't even hope for hope anymore. Like hope has escaped them. Hope isn't anything that factors in anymore. Um, and when you're hopeless, what do you care? You're gonna do whatever it is you do. You know, like now a lot of them are looking for a sense of belonging to something. There's something missing in their life and that in that social aspect of life, um, like just like taking it down to street gangs. Like a lot of these uh, these gang members don't have fathers at home. That gang is their father. That gang provides them that that grounding that a dad does. Um, there's Hell's Angels that like for different reasons, they wanted to belong to a family. And now if you, if you love that world and the family that is inviting you in is a family that carries with it intimidation and power and respect. And now by putting that patch on your back, like, like Joe, nobody, all of a sudden you walk in a bar and people are moving out of your way. People want to buy you drinks. People want to give you drugs. Girls want to hang on you when without that patch, you're invisible. Man, that's that's, that's pretty powerful, man. Yes, sir. Like it's 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 not. It doesn't matter if I agree with it or not. I understand it. Sure. Like like who like who doesn't want that? Sure, sure. Right, and that's the that's the vehicle you felt that some it. guys I mean, can get it. it. Oh, yeah. dude, yeah. yeah, dude, like straight up rock stars in their world. Yep. yep. Like the way they're treated and the way they're admired. Yep. Um, no doubt. Yep. Yep. And and you know you alluded to it a little bit before, but I just you, you know I. I want to just talk briefly about like kind of the betrayal that you felt from the f from the agency in general, and like kind of walk us through that. Your home was burned down, correct? And and um, you know the Hell's Angels, and then through MS13 and Aryan Brotherhood, like you had green lights on you and and hits. I mean, what the fuck is that like, man? Right. I mean, what it like? Uh, the worst part of of that entire event was that I had brought that world uh, down on my family. I can't imagine. Um, and and the 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 code was broken and it like like it wasn't just about me anymore it was like hurting me there was there was uh 
comments made to me like, dude, if like we know how to hurt you and it ain't putting a hole in you, it ain't shooting you, dude. It's freaking hurting your family. Like, like any of us, like any, like, so how are those messages delivered to you? Oh, so many different ways. Like, like I had firsthand face to face conversations. Um, the, the infiltration case ends and then my true, uh, identity, like who they thought to be Jay Bird Davis turns out to be Jay Dobbins instead of the, the gun runner debt collector turns out to be an ATF agent. Um, so the, the angels issued contracts on me. They were farmed out to the Aryan Brotherhood. They were farmed out to the MS-13. 18th Street picked one up here in Los Angeles. Um, other uh, side people came in, like 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 lone wolves who wanted to make their bones. Um, there was a letter intercepted out of the prison by the guy that beheaded Cynthia Garcia wow. that I helped locked up that said, like, why are you guys trying to like like shoot or stab this dude? Stick him with an AIDS contaminated needle, man. He's gonna go down and like, we won't be held accountable for it. Same letter said, you wanna make this dude pay? You really wanna hurt him? Kidnap his wife and videotape her being gang raped and showed it to him. Jesus. You wanna hurt him? That's how you hurt him. Threats to kidnap my kids off the bus. So Jay, how does that, um, like, what does that do to you, man? Well, the, the like, hard the part- What's the first emotion when you, when you see something like that? Uh, it's it's uh it's it's pretty dangerous right because like I, I think all of us know like like how to solve that yep um and my frustration was when those threats started coming out that um i like i never one time said well the threats were proven to be credible and valid and reliable threats they were accurate threats but like the, uh, my agency didn't want to investigate them they, they were just there was too many Why? they were too massive they came to me and said dude you're on your own where would you like us to start? Would you like us to start with the Hells Angels, with the contracts? You want us to go to the MS-13? How about if we start working on the ABs? Maybe we'll go talk to 18th Street. What about all this? Where do you want us to start? Like, dude, you're on your own. It's too big. But what, we but can't how, handle it. But even though you're, you're at this point one of the most distinguished ATF agents of all time, what do you mean you're on your own? Like, I, I, I don't... That's, that, that was, that's how blunt it was put to me. Like, you're on your own to solve this. So I'm sitting there, I'm like... Okay, like I don't really have any resources. I don't have the ability to go hide. There's no witness security for law enforcement. But I mean, uh, and, and, and how are you? How are you living your day to day? What, what, when, you, you know, when you hear like, are you are you constantly looking over your shoulder? I mean, what what what's the mindset? Looking over my shoulder, paranoid, like wanting help, begging for help, expecting help, feeling like I'd earned or deserved help. And not having it come. What does this do with you um, and your wife? Like, where where are you guys at? I mean, is you she know, aware of the threats? Yeah, and and um, like like why, like why she stuck it out? I, I don't know, because it would have been really easy for her to cut and run, really easy for her to, and you know, like like, so the agency doesn't that doesn't react, and like so I get in a dispute with them, like, hey man, you need to give me some help here, right? Um, so they double down on me and they unmask all my cover documents. They, they took all like, all like my address had been hidden. My, my driver's registration, all those things had been, they made that all open source information that was now public record. Three months after that, my house gets burned down and then no one comes to investigate the arson. And then I find out behind, uh, behind closed doors, dude, you are the target of the arson. Yeah, I'm see. like, what, what, wait, what? They're like, dude, they've rented office space. They've tasked, they, they've manned a task force and they're recording your calls. They're going to try to pin this arson on you. So like when I talk about, like we talked about earlier about the feelings of betrayal and like how I spent my life betraying people and how I felt like during the way I did my job, I betrayed my family. Like I, like I almost felt like, like I had it coming. I felt like, dude, you created this karma. Like. How do you like it? Again, that same like thing. It. You're looking at something you did. Mm. You're looking at your own failure. You're you're you're, you're, you're framing this because the only thing that you can change is sort of like making it your part. But but this is you crazy. Know, and so the thing is, though, it's it sounds like I have this like like this bitterness about it. I don't. I love ATF. Mm. I love the agents out there with their boots on the ground who are doing it the right way. I ran in to a perfect storm of power corruption and arrogance and incompetence in a little window that all took care of each other, that all protected each other. And the trippy thing is the same people that were that were doing this to me at the exact same time are the people that were running ATF's Operation Fast and Furious and running 
thousands of assault weapons to the cartels. Wow. Which would have never been discovered had wow. Brian Terry, the Border Patrol agent, not been murdered with one of the guns that ATF sent to the cartels. That doesn't happen. Operation Fast and Furious never gets known about. Wow. Right? Same cats doing it at the same time. They were, um, they, they had insulated themselves. And I guess it's the, the saying. Uh, can, can you just explain Fast and Furious for, to people that don't, don't know about it? Yeah. Operation Fast and Furious was this corrupt gun running investigation where ATF, which is uh, uh, tasked with uh, preventing firearms trafficking, in some kind of skewed, like, uh, twisted plan was allowing thousands of assault weapons to go directly to the cartels. And they were like, they were using it for like statistical reasons. They were counting guns in Mexico and they were like, bodies were stacking up in Mexico and they were using those dead bodies to justify like how we need more gun control laws here to prevent guns going into Mexico because of all the death and violence that was being created when they were the ones that were creating Who was it. funny? Who was profiting off of it? Who? Uh, I don't, you know what? But, but because, of, than, be, because <laughs> of, fa but, but because of Fast and Furious sort of getting outed, that, that ultimately outed the guys that were sort of fucking with you. Yeah, but you know what? Like, none of them paid. Right. None of them paid for what they did to me. None right. of them paid for Fast and Furious. Actually, some of them got promoted. Wow. Um, but for the people that make the rules, there are no rules. Yeah. They can do whatever they want, and they do. And they know they can. And they know they can get away with it. And, and, and do you feel, I mean, I was, I was talking to Mel about this earlier. I mean, how, do, do, do you feel like those threats are still out there for you? I, well... I'll say this. I don't live my life in fear. I right. live my life with concern. Um, if I put myself in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong combination of people, I could have a problem. But do I think that they're hunting me? No. Right. Um, like, I don't, like, I don't hide. Right. I'm not looking I mean, for a problem. Right, right. right. You put yourself um, out there. I don't hide. Right. Um, I live my life with concern. Um, but, like, I, I'm, you know, if... If I get confronted with a problem, I will walk away. If you give me the opportunity, I will run away. But if you corner me, yeah. like we're all going to the hospital. Right. Like all of us are. Right. Like I always felt like I've got God's hand on one shoulder and a pistol on my hip, and between all of us, we'll figure it out. Yep. yep. Um, and that's not cocky. I'm not looking for a fight. I don't want to fight. Of course. Uh, I don't want to fight these dudes. I can't beat these guys. Yeah. I've shown I can't beat them. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny because you know when I, when I, well, I, I don't know it's funny but you know what what you know when I was talking to Mel about it you know the way he said it is that you know honestly like now looking at your case and what you were able to do you know because I know George Christie a little bit too sure I know, I know George you know, as well and and and, and uh, you know I'm I'm dealing with the thing up in in my little town where I live um, uh, a woman that's re really close with us helps helps raise my kids. But, raised my kids since they were little um you know her her oldest her oldest son when he was 14 uh got linked up with a um a little gang out of santa paul i live in a little town called ojai california and uh he uh you know he's 14 years old uh, didn't really grow up with a dad a little bit of abuse um he got linked up with the gang only a couple months but he got into it with a bigger kid um who was in sort of an offshoot kind of uh, uh, a gang that was connected with the angels down in Ventura. And the kid was bigger, he was older, they got into a fight at the party, they both went outside, they agreed to have a fight, right. both of them pulled out knives. 14 year old ended up killing the 16 year old. Um, but he got sentenced to 36 to life, no priors, no nothing as a minor. Um, but you know, the angels really, uh, you know, to this woman that I'm very close with, uh, surrounded her house every night, revving their engine, scared her, intimidated her, threatened her. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I really care about this woman. And, and, and you know, like I've, I've tried to do sort of what I, what yeah. I can do to, to help. Um, Those dudes have their PhDs in violence and intimidation. They know how to scare you. Know how to scare you, you know? And, and, and when, I, when I talk to Mel about, you know, this situation, you know, the way he puts it, um, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but I just found it interesting. It's like, 
look, man, you got him. Like, like for him, he's like, at this point, everybody looks at what you did as like, you were just bet you won. Like yeah. you duped them. Like yeah. they fucked up. Like, yeah. you, you know, like you, you, you beat them and, and you were yeah. who you said you were, you had your shit tight. And, and now there's like, sort of like an honor in that there's like, you know, and like, Hey, look, man, if someone's threatening me or my family, that's not going to necessarily make me sleep well yeah. at night. But I just, I wonder what, what, what you thought of that. Yeah. What, what, what and I've, you've that? I've got, uh, relationships on various levels with, with, uh, current and ex hell's angels um and i've had you know like pretty dangerous guys saying like look dude i don't like you i don't like the way you did this but um you're you're pretty dang good at it man mm -hmm. yeah. and we understand that we do what we do and there's guys out there that do what you do you were better than us that's right um like like no one gets a trophy for it that's no right. one gets a trophy for winning that's right right that's right um Ultimately, they won. Right. Um, after two years of pain and suffering and blood and violence and all the stuff, and then all the aftermath and all my battle with a with ATF, the Hell's Angels are stronger today than they were when I started on them. They didn't get weaker; they got better. Mm. They got smarter. Mm. You know, I've had complaints with my No Angel book. People are saying, "Dude, like, okay, good story, good cop story, right? Interesting." You inspired people to become Hell's Angels with that. People like saw the other side of it, the glamour on the dark side of it. Like you, like that's a recruiting tool for them. And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay, it's because it's all about choices. Yeah. Like, like for all of us, right? Everyone's sitting here, look at yourself and say, choices you made earlier in your life, the ones you made obviously put you on a path, like you're successful and you're famous and you're a movie star. You could have made a choice that exact same day oh, that you. had you locked up. Oh man, I was right there. It's choices, 100%, man. Hundred percent. And like when you're a young kid and you don't have life's experiences behind you, and you're confronted with those life choices, man, you can't get it wrong because when you do, it's unrecoverable. What are you most proud of? Like, what are you most proud of? Uh, I'm proud of my family, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm and I'm proud of them for them. Um, I'm proud of them. Uh, they, they really truly showed me what love is because they, they just, they stuck by me and mm -hmm. like, I gave them no reason to, I gave them that there's, there's absolutely no reason why they should be in my life. And even if they were remote, uh, removed from my life, there's really no reason for them to even have any communication with me. Mm -hmm. That's how much battle damage I put on them. Wow. And there they are, man. Wow. wow. Every day. There they are. That's beautiful, man. And, 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 and right now with this, you know, like this sort of like anti-cop movement in this country, like what, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, you look like we're one day removed from, we're filming one day removed from the Uvalde shooting in Texas. We're a week you. removed from Buffalo, from the supermarket shooting in Buffalo. Um, so there's all these arguments out there of, uh, you know, like, like more gun laws, gun control, right? Um, like, like I, I think we need to do something different if I knew the solution, I would offer it, but I know what the answer is not. I don't know what the answer is. I know what it's not. What's it not? The answer is not to take money away from the police, to have less police. That is not the answer. We need to give, we need like the exact opposite of defund the police. Absolutely. Overfund the police. Get better, get more cops, get better cops, train them better. Every expert out there, and I'm not an expert, every expert out there says like, dude, train, train, train them, train them to deescalate, train them like all the things that hands. the shortcomings you, yeah, are. Exactly, absolutely. Right? Um, don't take money away from them. Don't try to weaken them. It weakens all of us, man. Do you have any opinion, do you have any opinion, you know, with, 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 with what happened, uh, you know, yesterday? I, mean, oh I, I know, man. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, look, man, like your, your perspective on like illegal guns, I mean, that's like, that's what you did, man. I mean, like, what What do you think about that? What, what's your take on guns? What's your take on how easy it is to get them? Like, you know, I, I, I know you said, I mean, like, are you a big gun guy? Do you still carry? Like, what? what yeah, I yeah. carry, I but I wouldn't consider myself a gun guy or yeah. a gun expert by yeah. any means. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do believe this. There's 350 million guns in the United States. Um, if, if I am a, a criminal or if I have a, a violent mindset and I'm willing to go out and murder someone, which is the ultimate sin, the ultimate crime, 
do, do I care what the gun law says right. about my ability to get it? Like we both know, and like like we're in an affluent area here, right? We both know in 10 minutes, we could get our hands on a gun without knowing anybody in this neighborhood, just going around and starting to shake some hands. 100%. In 10 minutes, we'd have a 100%. gun if you really wanted it. 100%. Right? And that like that's not... Uh, that's not like an undercover guy talking mm -hmm. that, or that's not a guy who's experienced in, in that world and, and the techniques. That's anybody. Anybody, dude. anybody. You know, when I, when I bring my gun with me every time I come to the city. I live out in the country. Every time I come to the city, I always bring, bring it with me. That is so different from like how I was when I was growing up. Like I grew up in a city that was the murder capital of the country. Um, you know, like, like Nick will tell you, you know, we grew up in an environment where like, you know, where we grew up, it was like pretty safe, you know, but yeah. you, you went a block to the left, you block yeah. to the right. <clears throat> and there was, there's kids getting shot at school. There was just shootings all the time. And it was, and so I was growing up, you know, to, to really like hate guns, I, I to despise them. And if yeah. you had a problem with somebody, you settled it with your hands. Like that's yeah. what you did. I just feel like for me, you know, now this kind of front row ticket that I get in different cities to law enforcement and getting to know these people from the, the shows I do and the relationships that I get to make, it doesn't seem to be like that anymore. Everyone's shooting each other. The gun is the great equalizer. Uh, when you were kids, you'd slug it out, right? The best fighter or the biggest guy or the strongest guy wins. It doesn't work like that right. anymore. Right. The skinniest, most punky, most wimpy, most coward can win because the gun is the great equalizer. So is the answer then is so is the answer then more guns, arm more people in schools? Like what do you like what do you think? Uh, it's just like it's it's such a societal question. Yeah. You look at like you just look at the world like like and the and the gun the gun argument part of it. You look at like the the issues on the border. You look at the the war in Ukraine. You look at the abortion uh, issues are all uh, back on fire. Well, not that they've never been not on fire, but, but they're, now like they're prevalent right again. Yep, yep. Um, uh, gas prices, the economy. And as a society, we're freaking giving two fucks about what's going on with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy. Really? It's crazy. So right now, I mean, like you're, you're, you, you coach... You coach football. You coach in high school football. You know, you're in a position right now where, like, you're shaping young men's lives and hearts in a way. I mean, some of the people that have the biggest effect in my life are my high school football coaches. Right. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, what are you seeing sort of, like, in the young men that you coach? What, what are you seeing in that high school environment? What are you seeing that encourages you? What are you seeing that, like, disappoints you? Um, how does what happened yesterday in Texas, how does it, you, you know, how does it play upon sort of like your role as, as a coach and mentor for these young men? Well, um, my kids are out of school, but like I know that, that you have still have younger kids. Like how terrorizing to have kids going to school now and not knowing if like when you send them off or when you put them on the school bus, whether you get to see them at the end of the day. And like, it's not like some kind of dream sequence uh, uh uh, illusion or imagination it's real dude it's happening all the time i think there's I, I think i read a stat where there's been 30 school shootings this year we're at the end of may when we're at a point where you have as good a chance of getting shot going to school as you do doing a drug deal yeah tell you what there wasn't there wasn't 19 uh or 26 drug murders yesterday right. i mean maybe there was maybe but between uh second and and fifth or sixth grade yeah, it's insane it's insane it's you know what to be honest with you i mean i spent like my entire professional life trying to make an impact on that um and it it's like the in the the entirety of it has caused me to question everything i ever stood for hmm. and everything i ever believed in um and it's 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 i don't want to give up but like there's days when I just want off the merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. I just want off the merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I did nothing, I accomplished nothing, I changed nothing. Um, and like, like I just, I don't know. I think that, um, you know, I imagine like, you, you know, it's all about what can we do today and like who can we influence today and what can we, you, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it is, I mean, there's, there, there's no like easy way to, you know, talk about kind of you know what happened yesterday and 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 uh i can't imagine what these what these folks are going through and i just uh you know. i don't think if if you haven't if you haven't lost a kid or lost a kid in those circumstances 
all, all you can do is is empathize with it and show mm -hmm. compassion for it because you can't say like, oh man, I know how that feels. Mm -hmm. No, actually, you know what? You don't. Yep. If you haven't gone through it, you have no, no idea. idea what. If, I have no idea what that feels like. Yep. No idea. Yep. All I can do is try to be compassionate for it, empathetic towards it. I have no idea what that feels like. Yeah. Yeah. And not pretend like we got the answers, you know? No. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, at Columbine High School about six hours after the, that was the first, not the first school shooting, but the first big one. Yeah. Right. And I can honestly say my DNA was altered that day, like walking around that crime scene. Um, I went from being a pretty happy, joyful person to being a really angry, like I just, I, I, I wanted to just go like rage and fight and like lock people up and like take guns off the street and, and, and stand in between like the good and innocent people in the communities and the predators who wanted to ruin that for him. I, I like it really set that home. I really like began to take a lot of pride in the responsibility in that. Um, but like my, my, my DNA changed that day. And it wasn't like there's, there's dead bodies of these kids in the school, in the cafeteria, in the library. And there's, and I mean, it was a mess. And I'll tell you what, what burned on me and I, and I still can't get that vision out of my head. There were backpacks, there were book bags scattered all over that campus. Wow. Like, and you'd think that like, you'd be focused on the, the body of a kid, you know, or the, or the, the blood stains and, and the carnage there. Like, I don't like my brain somehow has kind of erased that, but I can't get rid of all those book bags, all those backpacks scattered everywhere. Kids were shucking their, their belongings and like kids who went to school that day to like enjoy their friends, go to class, go to their after school activities, go to sports, ended up like running for their, their lives, lives and dying there that day. And I was like so, so angry with that. Like I was gonna, like I'm gonna do something about this or right die now. trying. Yep, yep, yep. Um, man, I uh, this was like truly awesome, bro. Like I, 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 I admire you so much, man. And and um, I think beyond all else, I mean, not even all these incredible the 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 life that you're living and the life that you lead, but uh, you're just like super humble, man, and and honest and direct. And I, I, uh, I don't know, I, I'm a better guy for knowing you, man. It's very it's, kind. It's, I, I really, really appreciate you. You're doing it, and um, I got just undying, uh, limitless respect for you, bro. And, I, I uh, think for all of us, for like what you do, for all of us here on your crew, for me, like, 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 just try to change the world for the better. Yeah. Like I said, like, like maybe it's just one person. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's one moment in one person's day. That's right. That's right. All those events have made me more spiritual. I lost everything. I lost my reputation. Like any any thought I had of leaving a legacy. Um, I was bankrupted by my by my fight against the government. I had destroyed my family relationships. I'd lost friends. Friends had turned their back on me. I lost everything. And then I realized after everything's gone, like God was still there. Like like he was still there, man. Like in spite of all my mistakes and all the things I screwed up, he was still there. And I learned I, I learned one really important thing. If the only time you're talking to God is when you're in trouble, mm. you're in trouble. You're in trouble. That's right. You know? Um, so so the great thing, the best thing, and why I wouldn't change anything, is because it all of that brought me closer to God. God doesn't come in and rescue you from all your suffering. Right. He uses that suffering to pull you closer to him. Like you have to go through that. And he's like saying, like, like, are you gonna come to me? Are you gonna turn to me? Are you gonna have faith? Are you oh, gonna yeah. believe? Or are you going to keep trying to do things your way, Jay? Because check it out, dude. They don't work out good on your plan. Follow my plan. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, information is not does not necessarily equal knowledge. Knowledge does not necessarily equal wisdom. Mm -hmm. And for me, like wisdom was always something that came to me right after I needed it. Thank you. Man. Right on, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys too. Thanks for taking care of me.
Hey, what's going on everybody? It's John, Bam Bam the dog. Uh, first, on behalf of both of us and everybody from the Real Ones team, I just want to sincerely thank you guys for, for, for tuning in. The folks that I bring on the show, they're family to me, and uh, being able to tell their stories and bringing you into their world is something I'm, I'm just super proud of and, uh, again, grateful that you guys tune in. We've decided we want to take things just a step further. It's a Patreon community. And basically what that means is if you become part of this community, look, I already bored Bam Bam. If you want to become a part of this community, you're going to be able to hear episodes early and all that, ad-free and all that good stuff. But there's all this behind-the-scenes footage, all this stuff that we've shot um, that really brings you into the folks that we've had on the show, really brings you into their world. Live chats with me and the folks that I bring on the show to talk about their world, talk about the issues that they're dealing with, about their triumphs and their tragedies. Just go to Patreon slash Real Ones on this website that you see right there right on the screen that's right in front of you. This whole idea was um, something about building bridges and, 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 and bringing people together and um, bringing folks that often don't get the mic and, and giving the mic to them. So the fact that you guys tune in means the world. Anyways, again, thank you. Uh, be good to each other out there. Rock and roll. I'm gonna get a workout in a little bit with my man Eric Linden, stunt coordinator from The Punisher. He's coming all the way up because we are about to get after it. And when that's done, he asked me in the car, are you gonna have my shake ready? And I know what that means. Am I gonna have my Sun Warrior shake? They've got the active protein, but they also have this collagen protein, which is amazing. They also have uh, the Warrior blend, which is a little bit lighter if you're trying to cut. And uh, I believe in it. I believe in that Sun Warrior stuff. Go to www.sunwarrior.com dot com slash real ones.